Those of you that are regulars know that if I'm in the house, we'll always get an update on uh, uh, the rovers. And so uh, this is the first or the second anniversary I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, just a couple days ago, we celebrated the 12th anniversary of Opportunities Landing. Um, how many of you were with us for our landing event? Anybody? Okay, I see a fair number of hands. This was really the beginning of uh, sort of our large space programs, if you will, for the museum. Uh, both Spirit, uh, which landed about three weeks earlier, and Opportunity, we had well over a thousand people uh, came to the museum to watch those. And uh, you know, we, uh, we keep looking for, uh, for new uh, events like this to, uh, to have all of you come in and, and watch with us. So we'll keep you posted about that. Um, anyway, today is the 4,271st Martian day since landing. And uh, just to remind you, the, the primary mission of uh, both Spirit and Opportunity were intended to be 90 Martian days. So uh, we're, we're certainly exceeding the, the warranty. So just a, a quick uh, recap of, of where they've been, and then we'll catch up uh, to where we are right now. So this was where Opportunity landed. Uh, this was called Eagle Crater. It's uh, a small crater on the surface about the size of the planetarium dome here. And um, if you remember, these uh, rovers came down with airbags, and they just bounced and rolled across the surface. And it turns out, as it was rolling, it rolled into this small depression and stayed there. Um, and so they, uh, when they uh, opened their eyes, they were sort of surrounded by this crater, but very fortuitously, there was an outcrop of, of uh, bedrock right along one wall of the crater. So they actually spent the first couple of months of the, uh, the mission on Mars examining these rocks. The primary goal of uh, both Spirit and Opportunity was to determine if these areas had been in contact with liquid water at any point in the past. And uh, um, by studying these rocks, they came up with about five lines of evidence that yes, indeed, there had been liquid water at this spot. So uh, very quickly, the mission was accomplished, and then everything else is gravy. So um, this was the landing craft. You'd see all the tire tracks of where they, they went in the, the course of their first couple of months, and then they finally exited uh, the crater and uh, been driving more or less ever since. So here's uh, where they landed, Eagle Crater. They climbed down inside a uh, uh, several hundred meter diameter crater called Endurance. Uh, they drove a couple years to get down to this crater, drove into that, and spent a couple years as well. And then they did this marathon down to this large 20 kilometer diameter crater called Endeavor. And that's where they are right now is in an area called Marathon Valley. So this is a, a closer up view from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, so from orbit. This is the rim of, uh, of Endeavour Crater, and this is Marathon Valley. And so they drove down, and I'll show you a, a blow up in a second, and uh, entered that valley last, uh, last year. And so here's the, the path, and here's where they're sitting right now. So very uh, fortuitously, this is a north-facing slope. And uh, winter time was approaching last fall, um, and they always try to park the rover on a north-facing slope, so the solar panels are uh, getting more uh, sunlight than they would otherwise. Um, in the southern uh, winter on Mars, just like on the Earth, the you know, when it's winter here, the sun is very low to the south. The southern hemisphere, when it's winter, the sun is low to the north. And so by being on a north-facing slope, you can uh, enhance the power situation. And so they've been sitting on that slope since, uh, since late last fall. 
And uh, here's where they are right now. Um, they're up on this hillside from orbit. They've detected that there are clay minerals in this area. And clays are very interesting to uh, the, uh, the geologist because they indicate, again, that water was uh, flowing, at least groundwater was coming through this area, and it alters the existing uh, probably volcanic minerals and breaks them down into clays. And so they've been uh, examining um, this uh, area of bedrock uh, for the last couple of months. And uh, so what they've uh, been doing just in the last week is drilling, uh, or rather grinding some uh, some spots into the into the bedrock, and uh, they're just about preparing to to put the uh, um, the one spectrometer down on the surface to measure what they can about the composition of this material. And so this was just a couple days ago. This is just the view from where they are. Um, sort of looking into the interior of Endeavor Crater. And uh, they, uh, the, the shortest day of the year, the shortest sunlight day of the year, um, was uh, late in December. And so the, the sunlight is slowly increasing now. So probably within the next couple of months, they'll be moving on from this area and proceeding for another two years or so before they have to find another north-facing slope. So here's the uh, the recap. It's day 4271. They've driven, uh, this is uh, uh, like 26 miles or thereabouts, uh, so 42.65 kilometers, and uh, taken a little over 207,000 images so far. And again, just to remind you, the, mission, the primary mission was intended to be 90 days long, uh, drive one kilometer, and uh, take about 1,000 images. So uh, it's exceeded all expectations there. OK, so let's uh, move to the other side of the planet and uh, look at uh, curiosity. So today is, uh, is day 1236. And again, just to, for the, the newcomers in the, in the crowd to uh, set the scene, this is where Curiosity landed in uh, August of 2012. This is called Gale Crater. It's about a 160-kilometer uh, diameter crater. This uh, oval here is the target of where they intended to land. And the goal was to land someplace near this mound in the center of the crater, which uh, they'd been studying from orbit. And what that, indeed, they landed right where they wanted to. This is called Mount Sharp. Um, they were several kilometers away from it. But the uh, exciting thing about Mount Sharp is, first of all, this crater looks like it had water flowing into it. And uh, Mount Sharp has lots of layers. And so it's a, a stack of sedimentary rocks. And uh, to a geologist, that's a history book. Um, the bottom layers would be the oldest. And as you climb uh, farther up the side of the, of the slope, you'd get to younger and younger um, sediments. And the instruments on board are intended to diagnose what the conditions were like when those rocks were laid down and to determine if those conditions could have provided a habitable environment for early life on Mars, uh, bacteria. And so that's what they've been doing for the last uh, three-ish years. Um, so where they are right now is, is sitting in uh, basically this area, this dark strip here is, I'm sorry, let's, let's look at a closer up view first. So. This is Mount Sharp from where they were sitting last uh, fall. And again, you see all these wonderful layers um, leading up uh, the side of the mountain. And so here's a view from orbit. Um, this is where they landed. Mount Sharp is sort of down here. And uh, this dark area is what's called Bagnall Dunes. And those are. Uh, are very thick sand dunes that are composed of, uh, from again, from orbit, it looks like they're basaltic sand, so uh, eroded lava flows. 
Uh, this would be similar if you've ever been in Hawaii and seen a black sand beach. This is uh, the type of stuff that they're expecting to find. What's uh, sort of exciting about these is they actually do have evidence that these dunes are slowly moving. So the wind is transporting the sand across the surface. This is one of the few areas on Mars where we've actually seen evidence of the dunes um, being transported. Uh, we do have lots of examples, starting with Mariner 9 back in 1972, where they took high resolution images, compare them to images uh, from orbit now, and they see absolutely no change at, at the scale that they can see. Here, we've uh, seen at least a couple meters of shift. So the uh, intent was, let's drive along these dunes. First of all, they have to go along them because the dunes are too thick. They don't want to cut across them and get stuck. Um, so they wanted to come down to where there's breaks in the dunes. And what they've been doing since uh, about last uh, middle of December, they arrived at this spot right here. And uh, this is a close-up of where they are from orbit. You can start seeing some of the texture on the dunes. And uh, um, so let's, uh, let's get a little update here, and then I'll show you some more pictures. I'm Bethany Elman, MSL scientist. We're here in the JPL Mars yard. And this is your Curiosity rover report. Curiosity is now roving through the Bagnell dune field on lower Mount Sharp. This huge field of sand dunes stands between the rover and the higher levels of the mountain. Sand dunes form as wind bounces sand grains across the ground. Dunes are common on Earth, but this is the first investigation of an active sand field on another planet. Here are pictures from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-rise camera. The dunes have migrated up to a few meters. This has been seen from orbit over the last few years. Investigating the dunes lets us test the physics of what we understand about how they move. Will they be different, considering that the Mars atmosphere is less than 1% as thick as Earth's, and the gravity is only a third that of Earth's? The Bagnell dunes are made from basaltic minerals, including olivine and pyroxene, which give them their dark color. We also see from orbit that the winds are sorting minerals in the dunes, and perhaps separating the olivine from other minerals. Recently, Engineers perform mobility tests at a sand patch near one of the large dunes in the Bagnold field to evaluate the performance of the rover. This is important because Curiosity has easily gone up and over some sands, but has been challenged by others. Once Curiosity is near the Bagnold dunes, it will reach out and scoop some of the sands. We want to understand how sands of different grain sizes may have different mineralogies and chemistries, so we'll pass the sands into the Curiosity's instruments, Kemen and Sam. As a quick demo, the rover will bring in more sand into its handling system, shake the sample up, and the rover does something similar with its sample and handling system on the rover arm. What we've previously been able to analyze on Mars is this fine grain fraction. What we'll be able to get this time is a coarser grain fraction to see if it's different chemically or mineralogically. This first part of the Bagnell Dune campaign will take Curiosity into the new year. After driving for a few months around more of the dune field, We'll make a final stop at a less active dune on our way up Mount Sharp. I'm Bethany Elman, and this has been your Curiosity Rover Report. Check back soon for more updates. Okay, so here's a, uh, a view from Curiosity of uh, where it was the middle of December when it arrived at the first uh, part of the, the Bagnall Dunes. Uh, this is sort of a, a 360 degree panorama and curiosity itself gets in the way and gets very distorted if you uh, do this type of project projection. But I uh, just want to look at this uh, dune here. So there's the Mount Sharp off in the background and uh, this is actually about five meters high. So say 16, 17 feet of, uh, of sand there. And what they're slowly doing is moving around in this direction and uh, just investigating some of these thinner patches and then they'll hightail it through to, uh, to actually start climbing the mountain. Uh, just a closer view again. Uh, these are very pretty, if nothing else. Uh, it's uh, obviously the wind has been sculpting uh, this for a, a long time. And uh, this is a nice uh, view 
at that main dune and and this is what's called the slip face so the wind is blowing from behind the dune toward all of you and uh, this is where uh, the sand gets to what's called the angle of repose and it uh, it can't get any steeper than that and so you start getting these slumps of, of sand flowing downhill and that's how the dune actually advances is so when this uh, slides down here you get some sand and then you get more sand blowing over from the backside of the dune and you keep getting uh, little avalanches. Um, so they, uh, they're actually taking repeat images uh, while they're in this area to see if they can actually detect any of these uh, slumps happening. Um, so here's a view of, of uh, where they are right now. So they drove into one of these thinner sand patches. This is the wheel track. And right here is where they've scooped up a couple of uh, samples of the sand. And uh, this is a close-up view uh, from the last couple of weeks. So that little sample scoop, it's about the size of a tablespoon, you know, measuring spoon in your kitchen. And you can see that it's, it's filled with sand. And so uh, then the next step, which is what they're doing right now, these are the openings for the... Uh, uh, the entrance to the, the analytical chemistry instruments on board and so they pop these doors open and then uh, do the sorting of the sand so in in one of them they put in the really fine material and in the other uh, they were going to to do the coarser material and and measure the composition of both of those so this is an ongoing activity right now um, this is a close-up view with their microscope camera. So this is about uh, 10 centimeters across. Um, and you can certainly see the individual coarse sand grains there. Um, just one other side light. They continue to uh, monitor the wear on the wheels on Curiosity. And you can see these dents and tears in that particular wheel. Um, they noticed this about two years ago that the uh, driving over the very rough uh, terrain was damaging these aluminum wheels. And uh, so they, uh, in an effort to try and reduce that wear, they've been taking great pains whenever they can to not drive on the, the roughest uh, um, terrain. They uh, try to scope out uh, an area that has fewer rocks or has thin sand like uh, what we're seeing here. Okay, so again, the recap for day 1236. It's driven about 13 kilometers so far and we're rapidly approaching uh, 300,000 images. So uh, stay tuned. I think when we last got together uh, around Thanksgiving, we had yet to reach these dunes and that has been a major uh, goal and so they're at the dunes now. They expect to spend probably another month or so investigating uh, the sands and then uh, they'll uh, skirt around the dunes and, uh, and start their, their uh, drive uh, or continue their drive toward Mount Sharp.